Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. We recently talked about the Stark Hyperspace War, one of the many small regional conflicts started secretly by Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis as a part of their larger plan to destabilize the Republic and eventually take control of the galaxy. The two Dark Lords were also responsible for the Naboo blockade and invasion, along with several other incidents that further created tension between the Republic's core worlds and outlying regions. Their fingerprints are basically everywhere in every conflict in the galaxy, and their influence reaches far and wide. So my question today is without these two Dark Lords, would the galaxy still have entered into a civil war, or could the Republic and Jedi Order have fixed the underlying problems in the galaxy and bring back stability and prosperity? The Free Trade Zone was created in 124 BBY. This was way before Darth Plagueis even became a Sith Lord and joined Darth Tenebris, who was his own master. The Free Trade Zone was only supposed to be a temporary solution to an almost millennia-long problem. You see, ever since the Rusan Reformation dismantled the Republic's military power, the Outer Rim had been left to fend for itself. A lack of stability and security meant a flight in capital, business, and industry. And just as quickly, criminal elements began moving in and setting up shop. This all happened without the aid of these two Dark Lords. The Free Trade Zone was supposed to fix all this by attracting business interests into a very business-friendly environment, and overnight mega conglomerates began setting up shop in the Outer Rim and quickly priced out any local competitors. You had companies like the Trade Federation, whose main source of income and therefore power came from shipping, and the control of flow of supplies in and out of the Outer Rim. They could short certain products, they increased prices, therefore increasing their own profits, or they could just threaten to halt supplies completely to get what they wanted. Then you had organizations like the Techno Union, which itself was made up of several different mining and industrial corporations. They were the ones seizing valuable land from local inhabitants illegally and stripping them for resources, which they would then process and refine for their many factories and manufacturing centers in the core region of the galaxy. They would then ship these finished products from the inner rim to the outer rim for a highly inflated price. Behind all of these companies was the intergalactic banking clan which funded most of these operations and usually had some partial ownership over these endeavors. Together this was a massive corporate cartel and they were able to completely dominate the region thanks to the free trade zone. And eventually most local governments were run by individuals aligned or bought by the cartels. On top of a lack of regulation and taxes in the Outer Rim, there was also a lack of security forces, as we mentioned before. This led to corporations creating their own security forces, supplemented by droids, and they also began arming their cargo ships with turbo lasers and shields. This drew the attention of the Republic Senate, which at the time was still full of pacifist factions who abhorred any kind of military buildup. Although these corporate armies were technically there to protect their assets and shipping lanes from bandits and pirates, the harsh reality is many of these corporate armies were turned against the citizens of the Outer Rim in order to collect debt or just enforce the mandates of the corporations. This is not the result, though, of Sith Lords or Dark Side magic. It was the result of a completely unregulated free market system, which was the result of terrible policymaking from the Galactic Senate. Free trade zones here on Earth generally are far less damaging and do in fact allow corporations and developers to step in and build infrastructure and housing that the government might not be able to do. But those free trade zones are still governed by the same people and police forces as the rest of the nation. In this case, the Republic's extremely weak central government just allowed the corporations to do whatever they wanted. Now, one other company should be mentioned. It's called Damask Holdings. This was a lobbying group with significant ties within the financial system. Now, this company does a great job at hiding its actual influence and business activity, but if you take a close look at the most important and controversial business transactions during this period of time, Damask Holdings was most likely involved in one way or another. It was Damask Holdings that funneled funds to Master Sifo-Dyas to purchase the clone army. It was Damask Holdings that supported a reform party on Naboo, which ultimately led to the election of a less traditionalist monarch who opened up Naboo to foreign investment to help tap into the massive plasma reserves on the planet. This involved allowing foreign companies and investors to come in and help build the mining and processing infrastructure necessary for a larger global operations, including the expansion of their local spaceport. 
The Trade Federation was one of the major investors for this operation. And it's very likely that without Damask Holdings, which is run by Darth Plagueis, none of this would have ever happened. And even if Naboo's government decided to begin harvesting the plasma on their planet on their own, they most likely would have either self-funded a much smaller operation or found investors through their own methods. Naboo might have just been another mid-rim planet without much galactic interest. As a response to these mega conglomerates growing influence in the outer rim, the Senate finally passed Prop 31814D, which re-established taxation in the free trade zone. Although most corporate entities in the galaxy saw this as inevitable, many of them, including the Trade Federation, would protest this move. Now, it's my belief without Sith intervention, organizations like the Trade Federation would have settled for some tax breaks or conciliatory measures from the Senate. The leaders of this organization were rational businessmen and not warriors. Fighting any type of conflict is full of risks, usually not worth taking, and more importantly, not as profitable as keeping the peace. I mean, why go to war with someone when you can just sell them bullets? Businessmen instead usually seek ways to go around the law or exploit it, but generally will not openly disobey the powers in charge, which is exactly what the Viceroy of the Trade Federation, Newt Gunray, would do. Now, Newt Gunray was definitely a risk taker and an outlier when compared to the rest of his Nemoidian brethren. But it turns out his meteoric rise to his position was the result of none other than Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis. See, Nemoidians came from a very, very harsh society. They were basically insects, so until the age of seven, they were raised in communal hides. Once they reached the age of seven, they were forced to compete with each other for diminishing supplies and food. This system was designed to weed out the weak and instill a healthy hoarding mentality in the minds of the survivors. New Gunray joined the Trade Federation as a junior trade officer and quickly rose to the ranks showing aptitude for politics. He would eventually rise to become the representative for the entire Trade Federation in the Galactic Senate in 44 BBY. This was exactly during the Stark Hyperspace War. This was another conflict that was artificially created by the Sith, who found greedy individuals and large corporations and organizations and convinced them to do extremely risky and dangerous things for self-profit, and more importantly, to create chaos in the global markets. It was the Sith who ultimately convinced Bacta companies to create an artificial Bacta shortage. It was also the Sith who convinced a pirate combine to team up with the Trade Federation and create false flag attacks that would lead to the Republic, allowing the corporate entities to mount more defenses on their ships. Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis not only had unlimited power and wealth to do whatever they wanted, they also had a secret team of assassins and mercenaries that they can deploy at any time. In 33 BBY, Sidious sent Newt Gunray a beautiful red-spotted pilot bird. This is a sign of great power, wealth, and privilege. And soon after, Sidious and Newt Gunray would have their first conversation, and the Dark Lord would reveal his powers to him. Shortly after that, the entire Trade Federation Directorate Board was wiped out, except for Newt Gunray leaving him in charge of the entire organization. Now, Newt Gunray had been chosen by the Sith as one of their operators. Sidious would hoard talented individuals like him throughout his career. Individuals like Will Huff Tarkin and Anakin Skywalker. Palpatine would skillfully influence their behaviors and use their own desires and fears against them. Newt Gunray was a pretty easy individual to control. He was driven by greed and a fear for losing his power. And despite the Nemodian's cowardice, Sidious was still able to encourage New Gunray to debt trap Naboo and blockade the world. He was even able to convince the Nemodian to try something as stupid as killing two Jedi representatives of the Republic. Something a Nemodian, even a risk taker like New Gunray, would have never done without backing from someone like Darth Sidious. After the Trade Federation was defeated, New Gunray managed to avoid any imprisonment despite facing four different trials in the Republic courts. New Gunray's actions were seen as so extreme that even other Nemoidians in the Trade Federation labeled him as an extremist during the Clone Wars. But New Gunray was protected by Palpatine, which emboldened him to continue his very nefarious and illegal actions throughout the entire war. But the Separatist Crisis and the Clone Wars was all started because of the charismatic leadership of Count Dooku. He had spent years doing talks and lectures in front of large crowds in the Outer Rim. He campaigned about the real and serious issues affecting the Outer Rim, but he didn't point his fingers at the many mega conglomerates that were exploiting the people there. Instead, he pointed his fingers at the Republic's inability to do anything about it. He played on the narrative of a tale of two cities and a galaxy which had two sets of rules, one for the Outer Rim and a separate one for the Deep Core. 
It was a very effective move and many worlds started joining his secessionist movement. Now, obviously, Dooku was approached by Palpatine shortly after he left the Jedi Order, but why did Dooku leave in the first place? Was he being secretly enticed by the Dark Lord, sort of like how Anakin was? Well, perhaps a little less than you might expect. While both Plagueis and Sidious had made notes about Dooku's personality when they met him and saw potential in the aristocratic Jedi, they never made such overt overtures as Palpatine did to Anakin. It wasn't exactly necessary. For one, Count Dooku was from a noble family that essentially ruled the planet of Serana. Despite not knowing this until he was older, he always had a sense of pride and drive that can be quite dangerous for a Jedi. These same qualities made him an excellent Padawan and later on Jedi Knight and Master. His close friend sifo always had these troubling prophetic visions of the near future, which in turn made Dooku fascinated about Jedi prophecies. It said that he saw visions that foretold great suffering and disaster for the galaxy, and this put some genuine fear into his heart. Dooku also disagreed with the Jedi Council's conduct and strategy in handling this future unrest in the galaxy. He believed that the Order was far too conservative and reactionary, and he believed this prevented them from protecting the actual galaxy. Then the disastrous Battle of Galadron happened, where the Jedi were tricked into fighting the true Mandalorians by the Death Watch Mandalorian faction. Several Jedi were killed in the incident, and in the following months, Dooku became more and more distant from the rest of the Jedi Order. We're not sure what Dooku would have done without Palpatine's intervention. Maybe he would have stayed in the Outer Rim and ruled Serrano peacefully for the rest of his life. But the beliefs he espoused during his talks about political revolution were not implanted into him by the Sith Lords. These were revelations of his own making. Which means we need to go all the way back again to the Rusan Reformation and how it kind of started all of this turmoil in the first place. An unfortunate truth about humans, because other aliens don't really matter in Star Wars, is that we tend to stagnate during long periods of peace. And during these times of peace, the institutions and infrastructures that are built to protect us usually are worn away by incompetence and corruption. This is a very important lesson that we can learn about even here on Earth. Look at this global crisis that surrounds us right now, a virus with no other ulterior motive but to spread as much as possible. It's a great test for humanity and it's also a great opportunity for us to look at the weaknesses and deficiencies in each governing system. The Chinese Communist Party's culture of censorship led to a cover-up and eventually failed containment. Iran's theocratic regime refused to look at the science and reacted far too late, and their containment also failed. In our country, our funny and egotistical president, who so many love because he thumbed his nose at the establishment, proved to be an incompetent leader and unable to respond to crises effectively because he spent half of his presidency waging a PR war against an opposition party and media that are equally responsible for all this nonsense because they will stop at nothing to destroy him. Meanwhile, our extremely broken and expensive healthcare system remains unfixed, which leaves millions of middle-class Americans unable to treat pre-existing conditions. It also creates a culture of fear for the healthcare system and going to doctors that is unprecedented in the developed world. This all leaves our country less prepared than we'd like for this crisis. But this coronavirus has made a huge mistake. It's presented itself as a real and present threat to humanity, and now all of our focus is on it. Humanity's best minds are racing for a treatment and a vaccine, and there are now dozens of different human trials ongoing all across the world looking for a cure. This virus has awakened the best of us, and I am extremely optimistic for the future. In many ways, this crisis is kind of perfect because it's dangerous enough to stop all of us in our tracks and finally make us think rationally. But at the same time, it will not destroy us. And so in the coming months, Career politicians will be replaced by actual leaders, partisan politics will be replaced by decisive action, and media pundits will be replaced by doctors and scientists and other actual experts. If you look around, it's already happening. And as I look around at humanity, I can't help but be proud. Despite all of this uncertainty, there are no riots in the streets. If anything, people are becoming kinder and more willing to help each other. And we must continue to work together because mankind, unlike dolphin kind, is good in nature. Mankind, that word should have a new meaning for all of us today. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. We will be united in our common interests because now, once again, we will be fighting for our freedom, not from tyranny, oppression, or persecution, but from annihilation. We will
will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. Today, we celebrate our Independence Day. So guys, remember to stay safe and watch out for those who are most vulnerable to this ongoing pandemic. We will prevail. Hashtag Humanity First. Hashtag Whitmore for President 2020.